Welcome into the Vestavia Hills City Schools podcast. I'm Whit McGee. And I'm Brooke Wedgworth. Brooke, good to see you again. How's your week been going? Good to see you, Whit. It has been a busy week. We just came off Friday night, prom 2023. Oh my goodness. That's right. When you had a couple of young men in that, I right? I did. It was, <laughs> it was a fun night. Very good. Quite Very a busy good. week. It really is. Yeah. So I saw that they had the uh, the prom down at Iron City uh, yes. in downtown Birmingham. And uh, of course, there's uh, some testing that's coming up here in the school system. The most wonderful time of the year it for is. that, right? ACT is tomorrow. That's right. That's right. So if you're, you're listening here, we're kind of at mid-March. Uh, testing there at the high school with the ACT coming up, uh, and then ACAP as well, which is sort of state level assessment for uh, younger grades as yes, well. Starting in well, we'll have ACAP starting in April. Okay, so, and then I feel like this spring and school year is just flying by. I mean, May will be here before we know it. It it is it just around the corner and a lot still to come and so uh, we will have uh, much more in our coming episodes uh, related to different things in the school system more about the one rebel one future plan as well and we're getting some uh, questions and thoughts on all of that so we're going to make sure that you have all of that information to uh, unpack all the aspects of the plan too today this is one of my favorite episodes every year that we get the privilege of doing. Mine too. Yeah. Anytime we have the opportunity to talk and interview our teachers, it's always fun and exciting for me. And today is no different. No doubt about it. So we have uh, each year in our school system, the opportunity to recognize outstanding teachers at each of our schools. And so each teacher or each school names their own teacher of the year. And it's an award uh, that is selected by your peers at the school. Um, and so th- this is somebody who has really stood out among the faculty as a leader, somebody who is just outstanding at their craft. And then from that group, we at the district level select a district elementary teacher of the year and secondary teacher of the year. And then those two individuals, their names are then put in the running for Alabama Teacher of the Year. And Brooke, we had an Alabama Teacher of the Year just uh, just a few years ago. That's right. Jennifer Brown was our Alabama Teacher of the Year. Um, amazing. Now she's one of our administrators, actually the assistant principal at the freshman campus. So she's able to continue to give back and really now mentor teachers. And um, I think she helps our Teachers of the Year each year prepare for that I guess competition, probably the best way to describe it. So we're, we're thankful to have her for sure. Well, and I feel confident that we have got another Alabama Teacher of the Year in this group right here with us today. Our District Elementary Teacher of the Year is a third grade teacher at Vestavia Hills Elementary West, Megan Humphreys. Megan, good to see you. Hey, Wit. Thanks for having me on. And our district secondary teacher of the year is a Spanish teacher at Vestavia Hills High School. It's Amanda Jordan. Hello, Amanda. Hola. Hi, Wit. Hi, Brooke. <laughs> it's so good to see both of you. They're joining us today uh, via Google Meet. Uh, and uh, wow, just congratulations, first of all, to, to both of you. I would love to know just right out of the gate from each one of you, what was your reaction to being named Teacher of the Year at your school? And then after that, District Teachers of the Year. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, Honestly, I mean, super excited, very humbled. But I was very, very surprised when I was named Teacher of the Year this year, because at the time that I was named Teacher of the Year, I was eight months pregnant. And so I knew that um, my school year was uh, going to be short. And so I was really honored, but very, very surprised. I uh, also was very honored and very surprised. Actually, it's a funny story. When they, my, my administration came to tell me, it was during my lunch period. And so there was no students in my classroom. And so I guess they wanted to, you know, make a big deal out of it. So they grabbed some students from the lunchroom and came in, but none of them were my students. And so it was like a fun, I got to meet a whole bunch of new students to celebrate uh, winning that. And so that was a really funny experience to see all these kids that were like, you're the best teacher, but none of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when they came in for district teacher of the year, I had already known that Amanda had been honored for the high school teacher of the year. And so I was, you probably, you might remember it, but I was really, really curious wanting to know who had gotten the 
secondary district teacher of the year because I had taught Amanda's son. And so I was just rooting for her. And it was like, I, we, I can't say a word. I'll have to tell you later. Um, and so I was just so excited to share this with Amanda this year. Well, and Megan, so when they came, I guess they came to tell me right after they told you. Mm-hmm. So that was my first question was, who won elementary? Mm-hmm. And when they said your name, I said, oh my goodness, she's wonderful. Because I really did. Like Megan said, I got to experience her from being a parent. My son was in her class last year. And so just to experience that other side, and she truly is just an exceptional teacher. I'm so, so proud of her. Thank you, Amanda. And I think just through this process, I feel like we've gotten to know a little bit more of things that we're passionate about as teachers. And there's a lot of overlap that when we went into this competition, just the you know, morale of teachers, collaboration of teachers, and that is something that we share, but just at different levels. And so it's been, it's been fun to share this with Amanda. Well, congratulations to you both. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of working with both of them um, as colleagues for several years in different capacities. Um, Megan actually also um, taught one of my sons in third grade. So I also know her from the parent perspective as well, but just, Both are truly professionals in all aspects, and they are so about their students and their classroom environment and teaching and learning and all of those great things. But then they're also really about continuing to grow and learn and impacting their colleagues. So it's not even just about themselves or their classrooms, but really how can they help their their, their colleagues and their and others in their schools and even across the district. So that is one thing that is most impressive to me. Well, I'm sure our listeners who may not know you quite as well as we do would like to know just maybe a little bit about your story and how you got started. So we'll start with you, Megan, if you'll just tell us about where you're from and really what inspired you to become a teacher. I graduated from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and moved to Birmingham at 18 to go to UAB. And through my time at UAB, kind of tried a few different majors. I was not one of those people who uh, knew they wanted to be a teacher from the time that they were in elementary school forward. That was not really my plan ever. And as I was going through college, I just really had a hard time finding my thing. And then I decided in my junior year, I was like, I think I'm going to major in elementary education and just completely fell in love with it. I loved being in the classroom. I loved being around the kids. I loved uh, UAB's program and how they prepared me to become a teacher. And I actually, uh, through UAB, was placed at Vestavia West for my student teaching. I was there with Lois Powers in kindergarten, had no experience ever teaching a grade that young, but loved it. And so after my student teaching, I was hired as a maternity sub in kindergarten. And so I spent one year, half of the year working in kindergarten, and then the second half of the year filling in for another maternity sub in special education. And after that was hired full time in third grade. And I thought I loved kindergarten until I was in third grade and realized what an amazing year that is to teach. Uh, The standards are so fun. The age of the kids, they're hilarious. They're independent, but they're still really, really sweet. Um, In third grade, we still teach all of the subjects. You know, when they go to fourth grade, they usually split off. And so even as a third grade teacher, I'm still teaching math and reading and writing. And I would say that I'm especially uh, passionate just about writing and helping students find their own voice in writing. I think that we underestimate just the power of words. Everything we say can be so quickly interpreted, you know, on social media or uh, now on video online. And just I've been really, really passionate about helping kids realize that what they say matters. That, that's really one of my favorite parts of teaching third grade. And so I hope to continue doing that. Well, um, I was born and raised in Lima, Peru, and I lived there until I was 14 and moved to um, a suburb of Atlanta, went to start high school and um, went from a very small school where I knew everybody to a school with my graduating class of a thousand people. So it was a huge high school. Our campus was a mile long and it was just um 
it was a huge culture shock, not only moving countries, but also just moving schools. And I swore that I would never go back to school ever again. I was going to graduate and I was, I was never going to step foot in another high school. Um, and of course the joke is on me because I ended up majoring in secondary education, um, Spanish secondary education at Stanford university. My dad said I needed to get a degree in something I could get a job in right after school. So I kind of like Megan fell in love with teaching uh, kind of after I degree, I declared that degree. I wasn't sure about it, but um, it didn't take very long for me to fall in love with teaching and to fall in love with um, high school again. Even though I had a terrible experience going through high school, I am so grateful that I had that experience because it um, really impacts the way I create. Um, I want to create a classroom that is safe for everybody that feels um a place like they can be themselves, um, a place where they can belong is really important. Not just that they have to fit in, but they can really belong. And that's, that's my story. So that's why I'm still here at the high school. Um, I've been here for 14 years. This is my 16th year in education, but 14 years here at Vestavia High School. Well, that's fantastic. And, and we're so thankful that both of you are educators in our school system. So Amanda, you said you've been at the high school now for 14 years. What is uh, something that you love about Vestavia Hills High School? Uh, even if it's a favorite memory from the school or just an idea of something that you love about being there? Our students are so service minded. I think that this is something that starts all the way back in elementary school. Um, I think that our core values that we have, my children are at West. And so the West core values are really instilled in them since kindergarten, but um, kindness and respect and responsibility. And I know all of our elementary schools have those core values, but every elementary school talks about serving others in some way or, or another. And that core value I see really impacting the high school. In my time here, we have a fall charity, we have a spring charity. And then on top of that, we have canned food drive. And there's, if there's a tornado, students are quick to, to jump in and to raise money for something. Or it's just, it's amazing to see how much they, they serve others. They take all that they've been given and they serve others. And that's just a, a, a really cool part about being here at the high school. All right, Megan, same, same question to you. How long have you been at mm -hmm. West and what do you love about West? So I have been at West for 10 years and there's so many things I love about West, but kind of to piggyback off of what Amanda was saying, I think that how the the level of intention we have for teaching character education is one of my favorite things about West. And you see that among the kids, how they treat each other and how they treat adults and how adults treat adults. They focus so much on academics. We have so much time that we're spending on reading and math and writing and all of those things they need to move on and through their education. But I hope that when they leave Vestavia Hill City Schools, they remember those core values for character education just as much. Um, and so that's really what I love as a teacher of the students. But as a professional, I love the community of teachers that I have at my school. It is such a supportive group of people who I know are there for everybody and s support one another um, to help each other become the best teachers that we can be. Another reason why I love our school district. Um, both of you, which you've already mentioned, are very intentional about creating a welcoming, inviting in your classrooms. And I would love for you just to talk about what kind of experience you want students to have. What do you want that environment to feel like for them? And what do you want them to say when they leave your class, or your classroom after being with you for a school year? I feel like to answer this question well, I have to go back a couple of years. Um, pre-COVID because I think like most teachers, there's your, your career changed. There's like a pre-COVID teaching career and then there's a post-COVID teaching career. And it's so funny to think about what kind of classroom I dream of having because a few years ago before COVID, a coworker of mine, uh, Carrie Haywood and I, we started just dreaming together about this idea of creating a co-taught classroom that we imagined it being a place that had really high expectations for academics, for all students, that it was an inclusive classroom where anybody felt like they could be successful, but it also had a 
higher level of focus on character education, as well as teaching some executive functioning skills like task initiation and organization and just really making more time for that in the classroom. And we really saw the only way to do that is by having two teachers in the classroom. And the funny thing about that is we had that first conversation about that on March 13th, 2020. And I'll never forget it because, I mean, that was the day everything shut down. And so we left school after having this like really inspiring conversation about this dream classroom where kids felt included and successful. And so over that spring when we were quarantining and over the summer, we just kept talking to each other and we kept planning and dreaming, knowing that, like not knowing if this would actually happen. And we were fortunate because we brought this to our administrators and they took a risk with us and let us try this. So that was three school years ago when we first did this. And it was incredible to see the level of student success, but also student comfort and safety in the classroom when all students felt like they could be successful and that they could be in the classroom for more time, that they had not just one teacher to go to, but another adult who was fully there for them full time and that they saw both of us and a classroom that had many lessons just on character education. And so we practiced the skills of how to get along and how to, uh, you know, conflict resolution and just like life conversations. You know, I can think of a student who was just like, man, this is, I'm going to have a really hard time leaving this class family. And so that's really what I want every year, co-teaching or not, that feeling that a student feels like they are really part of this class family and that they're safe. And I can attest to that because my son was in her class last year and um, I remember him and I'm going to get, I'm going to get emotional about this just because he's my baby, but he was just, he was so sad to leave her classroom because it really was a family and to have a son loved so well by a teacher known so well, not just by one teacher, but by Miss Haywood and then by the para that was in there was mm-hmm. such a dream to me because he was known and he was loved and he was pushed and he was encouraged and it was just a dream scenario. And so um, I just am so grateful for that because that really inspired me. Megan really inspired me, reminded me that what parents really want is to be kn- that their baby is known and loved. You know, I have all these people's babies um, and in my classroom and they might be very large, tall, and um, they're not, you know, can't sit in your lap, but they are someone's child. They're someone's whole world. And so um, I wanted to make sure that my students' parents know that I love their students and I want to create a, a space that they feel known and loved, just like Megan created for her students. And so it really, last year, just having my son go through her class really reminded me of the importance that it can be to create a space that is Um, that is safe and comfortable and um, that pushes them because I do I teach honor Spanish for and AP Spanish so I do I have to push them academically but I also have to create a space where they can fail and still be loved and and supported in that Uh, I'm looking at my board right now because we've been doing some core values work and I put on my board um, what I want my students to think about me when they leave and so as you ask this question I'm just like kind of just thought that was funny that I've been doing that in the last couple of days. But I just told them that I want them to know that I love them and that they have a person at this school that is here for them no matter what. And then I also want them to not feel like they've wasted their time, that they leave my class being a better learner uh, than they did when they came into my class. That's so powerful. Um, and, And thank you so much, both of you, for sharing. Um, I think it's interesting, that just an observation, Brooke, that, that how both of you kind of feed off of each other and just what you bring into the classroom. You work at completely different schools, but it's clear that you both feel inspired by one another. And, and I would say, mm-hmm. Brooke, after having spent time in both of their classrooms, I know you have too, that their desire to really make students feel included and welcome and safe 
is so evident. And honestly, that to me is evident before any of the academic stuff. I see that the minute you walk in, right? That's right. And I feel like that's key to any great classroom is really starting with that. That's your foundation. And then that really enables the learning and the teaching to happen. So that is, to me, um, it's a core piece of what what should be happening in all classrooms. So now that we're both over here, Boo-hooing. I'm telling you. Thanks Good to gracious. y'all. I'm like, maybe we should start a campaign for like two. Can we have two Alabama teachers of the year this year? Because I'm like, to me, how do you how do you pick one of these? Oh, I know. This they is would unreal. be like the dynamic duo. Well, I do, I do not envy the folks that have to make that decision because, I mean, both of you are, are all stars, truly. We are so blessed to have you in Vestavia. And so uh, a question for both of you is, if you are selected for Alabama Teacher of the Year, what would you want to use that platform for? Brooke, you mentioned that Jennifer Brown, our um, assistant principal at Vestavia Hills High School freshman campus, was Alabama Teacher of the Year just a few years ago. And if you're selected for that, you you have a platform with teachers all across the state of Alabama, and literally you will go speak and present, and uh, you'll even go to Washington, D.C. Uh, to, to represent our state and, and to advocate for education among, among uh, everybody in Alabama. So what an opportunity. What would you want to use that position for? So this is actually a question, one of the essay questions you have to write. And so um, thank you for asking that. We've already done our research. And uh, I selected um, that we uh, an, an issue, a platform issue would be to taking care of the adults in the building. Um, we've talked about COVID and how you have pre-COVID and post-COVID. And um, the numbers are, are a little... Um, staggering when we look at the number of people who are leaving education and we are having not as many people come into education, which is leaving our teachers feeling more drained even after COVID. And so we're, um, we're having teachers who are emotionally, um, just taxed. And so when this is an emotional job, you have to be emotionally whole or healthy to be able to then take care of all these other people and all the different tasks. And so I would really love to have some conversations with schools about how we can best support our teachers and our paraeducators and our librarians and just all the adults in the building so they can create safe spaces for their students as well. And it's interesting because I feel like both of our platforms really are focused on teacher well-being, but we also know that when teachers are doing well, that trickles over to our students doing well because our, our students need teachers that are that are able to perform at high levels. So when I was thinking about this question, of course, I kind of went through the lens of co-teaching because it was what I had been experiencing for the past couple of years. And through co-teaching, I just never had such a level of collaboration that I had had when I had another teacher in my classroom full time. And when I saw how much more our students received daily when they had more than one teacher impacting their day to day learning. But I also know that that's not always an option, co-teaching, and it, and it shouldn't be. You know, there are times where it's really appropriate, and then there are times where co-teaching wouldn't be appropriate. But one thing that through that experience is that it's not about the co-teaching. It's about collaboration. When you find teachers that you can work closely with, because this job is so rewarding, but it's also really, really hard sometimes. And that teachers need other teachers uh, to keep doing this and to do it well. We have a lot that we cover and that we teach our kids. And when you have more than one brain, adult brain really focus on this work, you're able to do more. You know, when I was researching about co-teaching, one thing that I saw over and over again is it's not co-teaching that makes kids be successful. It's not just throwing two teachers into a classroom and saying that that's going to help students grow. It really was having two teachers who are collaborating well and who both are teaching at a high level. 
And that collaboration is something that we can work on throughout an entire grade level team, uh, through vertical planning across the school. And so I think my platform would really be how do we help teachers collaborate in ways that go over into their classroom? And they're not just the students of one teachers, but every teacher feels re- responsible for an entire grade level's kids being successful and going on to the next grade level. Um, and so that might look like co-teaching. It might look like collaborative planning. In our district, it looks like professional learning teams. And not all school districts have implemented time for that, like our school. You know, we're so fortunate that that's a priority of our district to allow time for teachers to work together, to look at standards, to look at data, and to create effective lessons. And so if you don't have that time already embedded in your day, my, my thought is how can you inspire teachers, you know, across the state of Alabama to do some of that work yourself? Because when you really do see how much your students can grow when you work with other teachers, um, you'll never go back. You know, you'll never want to just be a solo classroom again. You're always going to be wanting to work with other teachers. I feel like that is something I'm going to say as long as I'm in this career. Well, now our, our listeners know how amazing these two are. That's it's, right. I mean, like I said, I've had the privilege of being in their classrooms, seeing them teach. Um, Megan's classroom is actually like right down the hallway from yes. from both yes. of our offices. So we really get to see her in action almost on a daily basis. I've been in Amanda's classroom, although I didn't understand m- most words that she spoke <laughs> because my Spanish is very rusty. It doesn't even matter. It's like you don't, I don't even understand all of what she's saying. And you can tell how engaging and amazing it is and how how involved the students are in the classroom and in the learning. So I'm just, I'm so thankful that I have the privilege of calling you both friends and colleagues. Like what two wonderful people to work with and to have teaching our students. No doubt about it. Congratulations to both of you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Thank you. you And thank you for listening to the podcast. We'll talk to you again soon.